Houston's biggest bash. Back on St. Patrick's Day, 1949, the eyes of all America were trained on Houston. That night would see the opening of the biggest, swankiest hotel outside of New York and LA. A gargantuan 1,200-room palace built by one slightly mad oil millionaire, and the biggest party the city had ever seen to celebrate. This was the opening bash of the Shamrock Hotel. At the Shamrock, everything was big. Texas big. It boasted the world's largest bath towels, the country's largest swimming pool, 165 by 142 feet, and a thousand car garage fitted out with four different types of gas. Quite appropriate for a palace built on the back of massive stratospheric oil wealth. If you had pulled up outside the Shamrock that evening, you'd have been met with a sight to behold. The giant Art Deco behemoth stretched up to 18 stories above with Irish flags hanging from its walls. Searchlights crisscrossing the sky and green and orange fireworks bursting in the night sky overhead. A reported 2,000 guests were invited, but some say tens of thousands more Houstonians gathered in massive crowds, scrambling over each other to catch a glimpse of the star-studded guest list arrival. Van Heflin, Ginger Rogers, Edgar Bergen, Sonia Henney. Yeah, I'll admit, I have no idea who these people are either, but substitute their names for the likes of Clooney and Johansson, and you have a pretty good idea of the caliber we're talking. Life Magazine called it the most dazzling exhibition of evening dresses and big names ever seen in Texas. Alongside Hollywood folks with thousands more of the state's wealthiest oil men and cattle ranchers, bucking the trends with their Stenison hats and cowboy boots, if you somehow managed to crowd surf your way to the entrance and sneak inside, you'd have been met with a world of decadence that would have made the great Gatsby blush. 5,000 square feet of luxurious lobby space decked out in 63 shades of green. Green reception pens, green walls, a green Steinway grand piano. Even the pull out back was dyed green. Young hostesses stood by the door offering packets of real shamrocks and a squadron of the hotel's 1,200 strong staff rushed around to keep the glasses topped up with champagne. With the drinks flowing, the ventilation system failing, and a thousand more guests than anticipated, crowding elbow to elbow in the common areas, it didn't take long for things to descend into absolute anarchy. Life magazine snapped a picture of cowboy actor Don Barry gallantly sipping from the slippers of an oil heiress. Crammed in like a bunch of drunken sardines, soon people were trampling over each other to get to their seats. A national radio broadcast of the night hosted by a celebrity presenter, Dorothy Lamour, from the hotel's Emerald Room nightclub was drowned out by a cacophony of drunken shouting. And cross wires meant the entire nation heard a pissed off audio technician in Chicago shout, they're f***ing it up. Couldn't have put it better myself. Eventually, Lamar fled into her sweet in tears as the riffraff began storming the Emerald Room for a glimpse of the stars, leaving the mayor of Houston himself sitting on the hallway floor with his wife. Time Magazine said the night combined the most exciting features of a subway rush, Halloween in a madhouse, and a circus fire. And watching over this glorious diamond-studded riot from the lobby wall was a gigantic oil painting of the man who made it all happen. A 32-year-old oil tycoon worth a reported $200 million, 2.3 billion today. At this point, nobody would have suspected that this Texan Gatsby's fortune was precariously perched atop a house of cards, even larger than the hotel itself. Because while his party is credited with putting Houston on the map, the unfettered extravagance on display that evening would end up costing him an empire. This is the story of the rise and fall of Texas's most famous, most controversial, most iconic wildcatter, the indomitable Irishman, Diamond Clem McCarthy. Say it can't be done, but I was born to run. Yeah, I was born for this, been through the storm for this. So if I'm wrong for this, then I'll be gone for this. But if I made it this far, then I can't slack now. Say it can't be done, but I was born to run. Diamond in the Rough. The rough next sun. But what comes down must first go up. Let's take a look at how Glenn McCarthy a poor boy's son from Texan oil country went on to become the Glenn McCarthy, king of the Houston Wildcatters. From the very first day of Glenn's life, the scent of oil was in the air. He was born to an impoverished Irish family in Beaumont, Texas on Christmas Day, 1907. Beaumont was an oil town situated right by the legendary Spindletop Gusher, 
where the Texas oil rush kicked off with a big bang in 1901. In fact, Glenn's father, William McCarthy, was a driller at that same field. When he was just eight years old, Glenn got his first taste of life in the shadow of the rigs. For 50 cents a day, he would ferry buckets of water from the pumps out to workers to save them from dropping down dead under the blazing Texas sun. Two years later, it was time for the McCarthy family to up sticks and follow the money to Houston, where a new wave of oil mania was just kicking off. McCarthy the older dreamed of striking it rich out there, but unfortunately, Houston never offered him any better luck than before. His son, on the other hand, took to city life quite well. Teenage Glenn excelled at sports. He took up boxing and played as the star fullback for San Jacinto High School. His sporting prowess landed him a scholarship to Tulane University, but an ankle injury brought that to an end before he ever set foot on the field. Texas A&M took him on instead, but this time he was kicked out before the season began as a punishment for hazing incident. Now in his early 20s, he finally managed to stick out a university long enough to play a game of football in the back line of Houston's Rice Institute, where he won the Southwest Conference as a freshman. The academic life still didn't suit him though. So at the age of 22, he left college to pursue a career in the wild world of petrochemicals, but not as a wildcatter, far from it actually. As a college dropout, the best he could currently manage was a gas station attendant. Ideas above his station. It was one spring day in 1929 while pumping gas at said service station that Glenn spotted a beautiful young woman in a Cadillac convertible pull up to the pumps. This was a 16-year-old high schooler named Faustine Lee. Not just any high schooler. She was a daughter of famous wildcatter Thomas Peter Lee, one of the most successful independents of his day. In Vanity Fair, writer Brian Burroughs described our handsome young gas attendant as having a single brown curl that fell rakishly over his forehead, a kid on the make with a temper to match, who could charm Lady Godiva off her horse. Those charms apparently worked on Faustine. They were from completely opposite worlds. His father worked the fields while hers owned them. Yet after just a couple of weeks of them dating, Mr. Lee received the news every father dreads. His 16-year-old daughter had dropped out of high school and ran off to marry some working class Irish ruffian. Mr. Lee's little princess was apparently happy enough with a second-hand wedding ring borrowed from the groom's mother and a $15 a month apartment, $250 today. She didn't mind downgrading her lifestyle for the sake of their somewhat inappropriate love, but the family were less than impressed with Faustine's choice of husband. And McCarthy appears to have gotten a bit of a chip on his shoulder as a result. From then on, he was spurred on by the strongest motivator of all. Not hope, not self-belief. I'm talking about good old fashioned spite. One longtime friend once told a radio show that Glenn was a poor boy. He got a lot of pushing around. He married a rich girl and her family didn't like him. So he vowed that he would show them he could do just as good as they did. And he had a grudge. If those high society folks thought themselves so much better than him, it'd make it all the sweeter when he'd crush them at their own game. The King of the Gas Pump. So Glenn McCarthy began waking up in the mornings with a new kind of fire in him. Despite the fact that he and his wife's love nest was a damp little one bedroom apartment, he vowed to transform it into a mansion by becoming a millionaire himself. At this point, he claimed to have only had $1.50 in savings to his name, which is $25 today. Hang in there, Glenn. Only another $999,998.50 to go. If we generously assume that pumping gas paid the average yearly salary of $13,088, it would have taken him a minimum of 722 years to close that gap, which isn't all that practical. Still, McCarthy turned down his financial assistance from his father-in-law and instead began in staking out a street corner in downtown Houston. No, he wasn't waiting around to rob people. Glenn was actually counting automobiles. For almost an entire week, he collected data on the number of cars going by and turned his data into a pitch for the offices of the Sinclair Oil Company. He wanted them to let him open his very own gas station there. Young Glenn was turned away time and time again, but eventually the company relented on the condition that they keep 100% of gas profits. That left Glenn with just the income from tires, repairs, and pine-scented air fresheners. Not the greatest deal ever made, but again, at this point, the plucky Irishman was less than a nobody. 
Once his new station was up and running, he came up with a strategy to maximize his gains, stockpiling discount tires and flipping used cars alongside the gas business. McCarthy worked 20-hour shifts at the station and had his father step in for the four remaining in the day. As a result of that somewhat manic work ethic, his station became one of the most profitable in the city, and the company soon gave him another one to run for his efforts. It's very nice of them. By his 25th birthday, this poor oil worker son was raking in $1,500 a month, the equivalent of 30 grand a month in today's money. He had cut that 7th century millionaire timeline down to a much more manageable 55 years. Mission accomplished, I'd say. However, maybe I've misrepresented McCarthy a little bit just there. He didn't just want to become a millionaire. He wanted to become a multimillionaire. The sort of guy his father-in-law would be desperate to introduce at the country club. And the life of a gas station franchisee just wasn't going to get him there fast enough. If he really wanted to realize his grand vision for the McCarthy family's fortune, he'd have to dive into the world which had left his own father broken and defeated and the father-in-law rich beyond his wildest dreams. He'd have to become a wildcatter. Act 3. The Rise. A disastrous start. In 1933, Glenn managed to convince his father and brother to join him on an expedition to Hardin County, Texas, to scout out a patch of barren land along the edge of the houston Laporte Highway. Some geologists from a big firm were running surveys around the area, and McCarthy smelled an opportunity to jump in ahead of them. Without giving it a second thought, he sold off both his gas stations, raked together his bank savings, and paid for leases on the land adjacent to where the surveys were taking place. Soon, the McCarthy family were breaking ground on their very first independent discovery well. He thought he was beating the big dogs to the punch, but in reality, they were happy enough to watch him blow his savings, showing them precisely where not to drill. Because the McCarthy well did gush forth, but with salt water, which actually sells for considerably less than oil. Even after seeing all his hard work go up in a plume of worthless muck, Glenn was undeterred. He approached the oil game pretty much the same way he did his love of cards and dice, saying, you've got to be a gambler to be an oil man, but only gamble with your own money. I go further and say that to be an oil man, you need to have a gambling problem. The will to slam all of your chips down over and over, even when it's 6 a.m. and you've already gambled away your watch, shoes, and the kid's college fund. We've all been there. On the next hand, McCarthy was Delta winner, he put his very last thousand dollars into an associate's well, which hit a very modest deposit of oil and netted him 8,000. Those profits were reinvested on his land in Hardin County, where he sold all but one of his patches of land to fund two last ditch drills, which both failed. For anyone keeping track, we've now gone from rags to riches to rags. Trust me, we'll be flip-flopping a few more times before we're done today. A man of action. Going back to the gas pump wasn't really an option. So after the wheels fell off his independent operation, McCarthy started running around Texas, offering to drill for anyone and everyone as a contractor. A contractor with a zero hit track record and only three failed wells to his name. To get anyone to let him into their office, McCarthy had to offer bargain basement rates. If that wasn't enough, he was willing to leverage his father-in-law's good name just a little to get a foot in the door. From there, he started building a name for himself. Geologist Michael Halbounty told Vanity Fair. He was known as a man who could drill a well in half the time it would take a major oil company, but also a man inclined to raise his fist at every affront, whether large, small, or imaginary. How was he able to complete his projects on time and under budget? Well, it wasn't always what you would call legal. Sometimes a bit of underhand tactics were in order. In a pinch, McCarthy and his men would sneak to neighboring drill sites in the night where they would relieve the owners of their pipes and barrels of drilling mud. At his next job, a drilling gig up in the pine forest of Conroe, 40 miles north of Houston, he performed one of his most legendary examples of his hands-on death or glory style. He and his brother were drilling for cotton magnate M.D. Anderson, an associate of his father-in-law, when the Derrick platform they were standing on 50 feet high, gave way. Anderson's attorney recounted, As the three men were falling, Glenn had grabbed a cross iron, and the other two grabbed him. His brother clung to Glenn's waist, and the third man to his leg. Glenn not only held himself 
and the two others securely, he then maneuvered the lowering of all three to the ground. McCarthy had suffered friction burns on both hands sliding down the derrick to safety. Otherwise, they were all uninjured. While some wildcatters were actually soft-handed supervisor types, McCarthy was a full-fledged guerrilla commando. Not long after saving his brother's life, he struck oil for Anderson with a well that put a star over Conroe on the Texas oil map. Another make or break. Now in 1935, at the age of 27, our wildcatter could finally afford to move his wife into a nicer place and finance his own drilling expeditions again. He entered into a partnership with a young wildcatter named Michael Halbounty to drill on a patch of land west of Beaumont. This would be his greatest challenge yet because the lease expired in just 20 days. In those days, farmers and ranchers were eager to have their land drilled ASAP. So they negotiated for strict expiry clauses in their contracts to prevent companies just sitting on the lease. Meaning, if McCarthy hadn't broken ground by then, it would be up for grabs to the highest bidder once again. On the evening of the last day of the lease, the owner brought along his lawyers to watch from the sidelines, pocket watches in hand. It had taken 11 days just to get the rig up there, and things did not seem optimistic. As soon as the clock struck midnight, McCarthy's golden carriage would turn back into a pumpkin, which made things all the more desperate when the motor refused to start. All right, boys, we're gonna start drilling this son of a bitch by hand, McCarthy cried at his team. They scrambled to rejig the equipment. With just 15 minutes to go, the man himself was heaving and sweating, driving the drill bit into the ground with nothing but a pair of tongs. His own notary called it. Just minutes before the lease expired, they had successfully spudded in, and the well, which would come to be known as the long number one, was theirs to keep. One week later, it became his first blowout. The man went on to expand into what became the West Beaumont oil field, which has continued producing all the way to the 1990s. McCarthy was showered with $2 million of glorious oil wealth, equivalent to $40.8 million today, still just 27 years old. So naturally, he did what any 20-something with tens of millions of dollars would do, and built himself a massive 7,000 square foot mansion near downtown Houston to accommodate his growing family. Four daughters by now, with a son on the way. got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. With that first independent victory out of the way, McCarthy found himself on a hot streak that looked like it might never end. He and a new partner named R.A. Mason traveled to the Anahuac near the Gulf Coast, where the humble oil company had allowed 21,000 acres of land leases to expire 10 years prior. That meant our duo could snap this deserted land on the cheap. On July 21st, their hunch paid off. Their number one white drilled on a patch of land miles north of civilization, which Humble's geologists had written off, came good to the tune of 588 barrels per day. At 97 cents a barrel, that's $11,400 a day. Pretty soon, the duo were throwing up a host of cheap wells that turned massive profits. Finally, McCarthy was gambling with a rigged deck, and his holdings were raking in a staggering 3,000 barrels a day. That's $58,000 a day in today's money. The road to petrochemical glory lay clear before him, so of course he put his feet up and waited for the millions to pile up, right? Of course not. The man approached his life like a drunken game of blackjack. In 1940, he went and spilled his chips across the table again, acquiring a boatload of land parcels at another much-hyped Gulf Coast site called Palacios. Using his existing oil rights and royalties as collateral, he secured credit for five shiny new drill rigs to deploy on the site costing him a million dollars. But when Palacios proved to be packed full of volatile natural gas, 
all five of his drilling rigs suffered catastrophic blowouts within days of each other. McCarthy now found himself $1.5 million in debt. To make matters worse, the big hand of the government had clamped down over his existing wells after a huge wave of supply started to tank oil prices nationwide. Restrictive quotas meant that they could only produce about 20 barrels a day, less than 1% of capacity. As a result, he was right back to square one, fending off bankruptcy by drilling as a contractor for other luckier businessmen. He became the go-to guy for any investor with a pocket full of cash and a thirst for black gold. But despite making a string of other men into millionaires still, it took him two years to clear his own $1.5 million debt. From 1942 onwards, he went about repeating these successes out of his own pocket. By then, the U.S. was well and truly elbow deep in World War II, so low prices and annoying production quotas weren't such an issue anymore. The nation was thirstier for oil than ever. General George S. Patton once famously said after his fleet of trucks ran out of gas while pressing on towards Germany after D-Day, my men can eat their belts, but my tanks have got to have gas. McCarthy's wells were all too eager to provide. By the war's end, he had discovered 11 brand new oil fields and expanded a bunch more. He was wealthier than he probably ever thought possible. $50 million in cash, land rights, royalties, and other investments, about $760 million today. So just to confirm, that's now rags, riches, back to rags, back to riches, back to rags. Incredible, mind-blowing riches. Act four, diamonds aren't forever. The man, the legend. By the latter half of the 40s, McCarthy was a Texan legend. However, most of the rest of the country still had no idea who he was. All of that was about to change when the nation finally cottoned on that the richest men in America weren't from old money families back in the colonial cities. They were loud, brash, alcoholic, new money Southerners out of cattle country. And in McCarthy, they found the ideal embodiment of that archetype. If his bold Texan charm seems like a cliche, that's because he invented the cliche. Brian Burrow wrote in Vanity Fair, the stereotype of the raw, hard living, bourbon swilling, fist fighting, cash tossing, damn the torpedoes, Texas oil millionaire did not exist before Glenn McCarthy rocketed into the national imagination in the late 1940s. And a big part of his genius was knowing how to play up his own legend. While the other rich oil men were shying away from the limelight, McCarthy was hiring a PR expert to boost his profile. He started dressing in the latest fashion of the day and donned a signature new accessory, a gigantic 6.75 carat diamond ring, which won him the nickname Diamond Glen. In keeping with the image, McCarthy spent his downtime cruising around his 15,000 acre West Texas ranch in luxury sports cars, blasting a shotgun at the wildlife. As legend grew, so too did his business empire. McCarthy uses incredible wealth to dabble in a vast spread of new ventures. He owned a radio station, a bar, two banks, a whiskey brand called Wildcatter, a chemical company, 14 newspapers, an exporting and importing firm, a stock of price cattle, and served as head of both Eastern Airlines and the United States Petroleum Association. But even after all that, Houston High Society, to which his wife once belonged, never seemed willing to accept him. I wonder why. Perhaps it had something to do with, well, basically, if you flick to a random page of any Glenn McCarthy biography, you'd be forgiven for thinking he was more of a mob enforcer than an oil man. A 1940s issue of Life magazine wrote, he is barred from several Texas clubs, which have found that he works, drinks, and brawls with equal vigor. Yep, Glenn really put the wild in Wildcatter. The man was basically Conor McGregor in a cowboy hat. <laughs> Which is why about 50% of his legendary feats are to do with gushing wells and the rest concern gushing wounds. Like for example, the time he cracked a tin can over a businessman's head at a hunting lodge in 1940, scarring the guy's face for life, or the time he knocked out a doctor on a flight down to South America. That kind of behavior was what prompted the Houston Country Club to write him a private letter, politely stating that they'd rather not have him around anymore. You need to Diamond Glenn was livid. No matter what he achieved, those well-to-do snobs would always look down on him. But if the other kids weren't going to let him play anymore, then he'd just have to build his own damn clubhouse. A Texan Taj Mahal. Which brings us to that 18-story monument to capitalism from the start of the story. The Shamrock Hotel. 
By the time the three-year project was finished in 1949, McCarthy had over 400 producing oil and gas wells and an estimated net worth of 200 million, 2.3 billion today. He envisioned this being his own personal Taj Mahal, a monument to last through the ages. But Taj Mahals don't come cheap. The total construction cost was $21 million, it's $240 million today, which was actually quite conservative compared to the original plans for a sprawling entertainment and shopping complex, Vane glamorously dubbed the Vane McCarthy Center. He spared no expense on the amenities either. Each of the 1,100 rooms had AC and televisions, and even the trash rooms were refrigerated to beat the Texas heat. The Houston Chronicle doted on McCarthy for his attempt to put Houston on the map, calling the Shamrock perhaps the greatest project ever undertaken by an individual in Texas. After that mixed bag of an opening night, the hotel became the default luxury accommodation for visiting politicians and celebrities. Its Emerald Room nightclub played host to Sinatra and hosted Houston's only national radio show, Saturday at the Shamrock. Meanwhile, its pools would become the place to go for for wealthy young Texan woman to be seen. You couldn't tell from looking at the place, but all of that glitz and glamour was actually concealing some pretty dire financial woes. Once again, the gambler had severely overplayed his hand. Easy come, easy go. So what was the problem exactly? I mean, the man made his millions, so he had plenty of cash to blow on whatever the hell he wanted to, right? Well, not really. See, in his rush to become America's next top industrialist demigod, McCarthy broke his own golden rule. Remember when he said, you've got to be a gambler to be an oil man, but only gamble with your own money? Well, by the time they broke ground on the shamrock, he wasn't playing with his own cash anymore. To fund all of these various new ventures, our olden days billionaire actually borrowed money from the equitable life Assurance Society of the United States using his oil rights as collateral. He was essentially gambling on his wells continuing to spring up in abundance for the foreseeable future. Three separate appraisals of his oil assets through the 1940s came at a progressively higher valuations, peaking at 73.5 million. That was enough to secure him loans of over $30 million to cover all of his pet projects. But the company soon realized that profitability was never really his main intention. Take that Shamrock launch party, for example. McCarthy blew more cash on useless stuff that night than most could earn in a lifetime. His 250 most treasured guests received invitations handwritten on white doe skin, which is a lot cheaper than standard printer paper, believe me. Those Shamrocks handed out to guests in the lobby, he had 2,500 of them flown in from Ireland. Round back of the hotel, they had a whole ass water skiing demonstration in the pool. Those Hollywood celebrities and businessmen didn't just come by chance. McCarthy bought and customized a private plane from Howard Hughes and chartered a customized train to bring them all down. He even gave out custom shamrock lingerie to all the women on board. All in all, the night cost reported 1 million, closer to 11.5 million in today's money. And that's not even taking into consideration all the groundwork he laid for the event. To bring Hollywood to Houston, McCarthy went all out up in California. One year before the hotel opened, he traveled to Tinseltown and founded his own film production company, dining with producers, wooing directors, flattering actors, and um, <clears throat> banging starlets. Don't tell Faustine. Before long, he was a well-connected film producer himself, financing countryside heart warmer The Green Promise, which currently has a 36% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes and only two critic reviews. Hardly a classic. The film premiere in downtown Houston was timed to coincide with the Shamrock Party. As you can imagine, none of that stuff comes cheap. The mad millionaire kept up that loose-fisted ethos at the Shamrock. And as a result, the hotel was an absolute black hole of cash just months after opening. Suddenly, the insurance company was starting to think, they might never see their money back if they let this mad, drunken wildcatter keep spinning the roulette wheel with his fortune. Punching his way out. As I said before, McCarthy's house of cards was stacked up higher than the shamrock itself, and the 1950s would be characterized by a series of wobbles, followed by total collapse. After a chemical plant project ended in disaster, 
McCarthy was suddenly unable to make his repayments. Our man dealt with his impending downfall the only way he knew how, by getting blackout drunk and beating the ever-loving shit out of people. Most of the time, the core club whiskey bar in the hotel was the ordinary Irishman's de facto headquarters. A jeweler named Steve Chazanow, who piled his trade in the hotel lobby for almost four decades, said of McCarthy's beloved watering hole, the core club was the only place you could go into, mind your own business, and get the stuffing kicked out of you. Never was that more true than during these turbulent times. At 42, McCarthy wasn't a young man anymore but he was still game for a fight. One Houston radio host got knocked clean out by the Wildcatter in spring of 1949 and sued him for $87,000, it's a million dollars today. I'd be more than willing to take one on the chin for that. Later on, he chased a young Hollywood producer down the corridor shouting, one Irishman can beat up eight Englishmen any day. Then in the fall, our wannabe MMA fighter was wrapped up in a lawsuit with the sports promoter. After jumping on his desk, kicking the man in the chest, then leaping in for the ground to pound. Court documents show the bookmaker claimed to have been held hostage at the Shamrock for a whole two days. But as my therapist keeps telling me, there are just some problems that you can't punch your way out of. The inevitable end. When the insurance firm conducted fresh appraisals of their all important collateral, they discovered that the King of Houston Wildcatters, so desperate to raise quick cash, had pushed dozens of his wells past capacity. Some were damaged from the strain and others were completely ruined. Their estimates of McCarthy's net worth plummeted accordingly. Whispers began to circulate that Texas's bombastic, too big to fail oil baron might be on the verge of bankruptcy, especially when he was spotted slinking around the White House in October of 1949. Several months later, he announced that the government had allowed him a $70 million private loan to fend off the total collapse of his empire the biggest government loan ever given to a private individual at the time. Publicly, he tried to save face by blaming the sheiks of Arabia and their cheap oil, even posing for a Time magazine cover just a few months later. But just one year after that iconic magazine spread, Houston's most beloved bombastic oil man was finally brought to heel. The insurance firm sent a lawyer named Warner H. Mendel to take over the presidency of all McCarthy companies, while the man himself remained chairman and public face. Essentially, the deal was, back the hell up and we'll let you keep your hotel and your pride. That unsteady truce didn't hold for long. Gradually, the men in suits cut down on the tycoon's extravagant plans, axing nightclub events and holiday celebrations. In the end, McCarthy tried to punch his way out of this one too, squaring up to the smaller Mendel. To his credit, the lawyer didn't flinch. Calmly, coolly, he told the Wildcatter there were to be no further illusions as to where the final control lay on matters relating to hotel operations. Just like that, McCarthy became a king without a castle. He sent himself into exile, wandering around the Middle East and Africa, attempting, unsuccessfully, to secure drilling rights as far as Egypt. Upon his return, the company finally decided to foreclose on its loans. On April 8, 1952, the Baytown Sun reported Glenn McCarthy stepped down today as the chairman of the board of the firm, which made him a millionaire, but couldn't pay its bills. McCarthy was finished. The final knife to the Wildcatter's heart came in 1954, when his painting over the Shamrock Lobby was replaced with one of Conrad Hilton, who purchased Houston's pride and joy from the insurance firm earlier that year. The End Times Diamond Glen's Orgy Palace So, down and out, does our Wildcatter have enough gas left in the tank to go from rags to riches one last time? He certainly believes so. In 1953, Diamond Glen leased one million acres down in Bolivia for an oil and natural gas expedition to get back on his feet. To finance his new venture, he sold shares to the public and a flood of mail orders came in from across Texas. Apparently, McCarthy's brand name was still strong. McCarthy struck lucky time and time again on his new land throughout 1954, but he soon discovered that the infrastructure down there was years behind his ambitions. There was no pipeline with which to transport his newfound bounty. You'd think that he would have checked that beforehand, right? In the end, he wound up liquidating pretty much all of his remaining assets just to pay off his debts. By his 50th birthday, the king of the Wildcatters, once one of the richest men in the world, 
only had his beloved core club left, which he relocated to a downtown office building. From then on, his story is just a bit sad. In his backroom office, the single reminder of his former glory was a poster for the 1956 movie Giant, based on an Edna Ferber novel of the same name. The main character, Jet Rink, played by James Dean, was based on Diamond Glenn himself, but had the writers known how the real Wildcatters story ended, they might have needed an R rating for the flick. With Glenn approaching his 60s, even the court club's glamour began to fade, and membership dropped off a cliff. The final straw was in 1967, when the city police raided the club following allegations that the 60-year-old ex-oil man had hosted an orgy there. Four years later, he sold the club. One more, and he sold his beloved 1937 mansion. With his wife Faustine still by his side, he retired to a thoroughly normal little suburban house in the town of Laporte and spent the following decades helping care for his 14 grandchildren. So that's rags to riches to rags to riches to rags, incredible mind-blowing riches, and straight back down to rags again. Unfortunately, that's where our Wildcatters ride on the carousel of wealth ended the demolition of the Shamrock. Another thing that the fictional biopic giant never predicted was perhaps the most tragic episode in McCarthy's life. On the morning of June 1st, 1987, the demolition crew arrived at the Shamrock Hotel. The Hiltons had sold it to a medical center for a cut rate price, and all they wanted to keep was the parking lot. McCarthy himself, now pushing 80 and walking with a limp, made a surprise appearance among the small group of protesters on the roadside that morning. His fist didn't serve him so well anymore, but his lungs were just fine. The indomitable Irishman was reportedly heard shouting and swearing at the contractors from behind the picket line. It was, of course, futile. Like the rest of Diamond Glen's empire, the Shamrock crashed down into a pile of rubble. Built as a fortress for his own ego, some believe it was the destruction of the hotel which finally killed the man himself. They had quite literally crushed his dreams. The hotel's old marketing manager, Tob Horan, said, it was a sense his son. He died of a broken heart. What he meant was that one month after the demolition, McCarthy suffered a massive kidney failure and his wife Faustine sent him off to a retirement home. A shadow of his former self, he spent his final months there before passing away quietly on December 26, 1988, a day before his 81st birthday. And there ends the story of Diamond Glenn McCarthy, the most flashy, extravagant, violent, bombastic, personality ever to come out of the crazy world of the Wildcatters. And that's saying something. His pioneering spirit helped establish Houston as a dynamic city of the future to the rest of the nation. But due to his own wild gambler's nature, the man himself never got to share in that future. All in all, I'd say his life is a cautionary tale about when to call it quits, cash in your chips. Throughout his storied career, the King of Houston Wildcatters drilled somewhere around 800 to 1100 new wells, but in the end, he came up dry.